Hello, my name is Brian Pringle. I will be your instructor for this class. The purpose of this lesson is to teach you some of the history of the internet and also some of the technologies that are used to make up the web. Before we get started, the first thing you need to know is that the internet is a proper noun, therefore it should be capitalized. Same thing with web. The web is capitalized. The web and the internet are interrelated, except the internet is the collection of computers that are spread throughout the world that are using what is called the TCP IP networking protocol. The web is just a small portion of the entire internet. The web is where we actually look at web pages. The distinction between the two of those are that they both use TCP IP, but on the web we also use another protocol called HTTP or the Hypertext Transport Protocol. Now on the web we use web pages which use the HTML language to actually create the pages and those HTML pages are transmitted using HTTP. The internet is a large collection of computers that was started back in the 60s as a way for military, government, schools, and a couple of research laboratories to actually be able to transfer and share information without actually having to walk from one place to the other. There were a large amount of federal regulations that prevented the internet from being used for commercial purposes until 1995. In 95, it became available for commercial use. When we're talking about items on a network, and specifically the internet, any device that is connected to the network is considered to be a node. Now, a node is any device. So that could be a uh, network switch, a router, a computer, it could be a wireless access point, anything of that nature. Uh, we have different types of nodes, though. We have some that are called servers, and I'm sure you've heard of web servers and file servers and things of that nature. The ones that we're going to play with for the Internet are going to be web servers, FTP servers, and email servers, and then we'll also have things called application servers that, that you'll play with in other classes. A device that consumes resources on the web is called a client, and these are going to be workstations, tablets, laptop computers, smartphones, there are even dog collars that connect to the internet. These are all types of clients. They consume resources. Every device that is connected to a network has to have what's called a MAC address, and the MAC address is the uh, media access control address, and its purpose is to have a physical address for every device. It is hard-coded into each device. It is set by the manufacturer. Outside of the scope of this class, yes, there are ways to change it, but what we're dealing with, the MAC address is hard-coded and should never be changed. We're also going to be using a thing called an IP address. Now, the IP address is a logical address. This one can change, and every device that is connected to the network specifically the internet, needs to have an IP address. A good analogy between the two of these is going to be your house. Your house has a physical location. You have your GPS address, so you have your latitude and longitude, and that is never going to change. That would be like your MAC address. However, the number that is on your mailbox could change. If 911 ever comes through and says, hey, we need to renumber the houses, then that number could change. That would be like your IP address. So the, the mailbox address, the one that could change, is like your IP address. The house's physical location, the latitude and longitude, that would be like your um, the MAC address. Okay, so the IP addresses, we have two different types of IP addresses that we can use. The most common one is IP version 4, and even though it's the older type, it is still the dominant IP uh, versioning that is used on the Internet. It is considered to be a dotted decimal notation. What that means is you have four parts to your address and an IP address will look something like this. So you have a number here between 0 and 255, a number here between 0 and 255, 0 to 255, 0 to 255, and so forth. Now this is a 32-bit address and what that means is that there are 2 to the 32 power addresses, so that's actually about 4 billion addresses that are possible. Now that would actually be enough addresses for everybody in the world, except large chunks of those are given to federal governments, large chunks of 
of uh, these are given to businesses and a lot of these are actually reserved so there actually are not enough IP addresses to go around which means in the IP version 4 scheme we're running out of addresses so to work around this the new scheme is called IP version 6 this is a 128 bit uh, scheming so it's 2 to the 128 bit so that's approximately 340 undecillion and that's 340 billion 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 addresses that's enough addresses for everybody to have approximately 7.7 .7 billion addresses so you could have 7.7 .7 billion addresses now there are um, there are going to be some chunks that are reserved there are going to be some numbers that actually won't be usable so it's actually more in the 3 billion addresses for each person, but it's still more than enough to cover all of your devices. When we're talking about the web, one of the things we always talk about is a website address. The, the actual proper name for a website address is a URL or a uniform resource locator. Now a URL looks like this. You've probably seen one of these before when you type them into a web, a web browser's address bar. And it's made up of different parts. This HTTP here at the beginning, this is the protocol being used. I said earlier we use HTTP for web pages. The www.example.com, this actually makes up the domain name. This example.com is the part that I actually purchase to host or to um, direct people to my website. The www is actually a server within my, within my IP range. And so what that means is I could have different things here. I don't have to have www. It's just the standard. But I could have something like test or server or web or whatever I want it to be called. It's just simply telling everybody what server they're using once they get to my example.com domain. The .com is actually called a top level domain. We have a bunch of different ones. We have .org, .net, .com, .cc. There are a bunch of new ones that just came out recently. Um, then the next thing is the folder. We can put files inside of a folder. We don't necessarily have to, but if we want to, we can put them in a folder. And then we have the file that's being retrieved. So this whole address here tells my browser a bunch of different things. It tells it where my or what my domain name is. Once it knows what my domain name is, what is the name of my server, what folder are we looking for, and then what is the file that we're actually trying to find. There are other parts that you actually don't see when you just type an address into the address bar. When I type in www.example.com, my browser is actually going to fully qualify it as something that looks more like this, http colon forward slash forward slash www.example.com dot colon 80. Okay, now the little dot is what's called the root of the DNS namespace. This tells my web browser that this is the end of the domain name. The colon specifies that the number following is going to be the port number that's used, and the port number is used by the receiving computer to tell it what application should process this request. So in this case, port 80 is typically our HTTP protocol. This is typically a packet that would go to our, our web server application. So when I type in Facebook.com, there are a bunch of things that are going to happen when I type in Facebook.com. First off, my browser is going to fully qualify the domain name. So it'll, it'll change it into HTTP colon forward slash forward slash www.facebook.com dot. And then what it's going to do is turn around and it has to figure out where Facebook.com is. So the way that it does this is by using a service called DNS or the domain name services. So the address that we have here, this Facebook.com, is just strictly for us humans. Our computer doesn't actually understand what this is. Our computer can only understand IP addresses. So what happens is our computer has to turn around and look for the DNS name servers to tell it where Facebook.com is. Okay, so we're going to use DNS. Every website that's out there has an IP address. Now there are some what are called shared hosting services where I may have multiple websites that are sharing one IP address. But in general, um, and I, each domain name would have its own specific IP address. All right, so could you imagine having to remember IP addresses for Google and Facebook and your email service and every other website that you've ever used? Could you imagine having to remember all of those IP addresses? 
Well, the nice thing is we don't have to because we have DNS. DNS is considered to be the phone book for the internet. So what happens is when I type in www.example.com, in this example, the following thing happens. Our browser is going to turn around and actually look at what's called a local DNS cache. It's going to look on its hard drive to see if it knows where example.com is. If it finds that it doesn't know where example.com is, then it's going to turn around it's going to start asking some servers on the internet. So the first thing that it's going to do is it's going to talk to the root DNS server. Remember that dot that I said was here? That specifies the root DNS server. So what my computer will do is it'll turn around and it will ask the, DN the root DNS server, do you know where example.com is? The root DNS server has no clue. So the root DNS server will say, no, but I can tell you where the .com server is. So then the browser will turn around and ask the .com server if it knows where example.com is. And example.com, I'm sorry, the com server will say no, but it knows where the example server is. And then when it finds examples DNS server, then we can query it for where www is. So we have this process where we start at the, the root DNS server, then we go to the TLD servers, then we go to the domains DNS server, and then we're actually able to find the website. All of that actually happens in less time than it takes for you to blink. So as far as us as web designers, we need to figure out what we're going to be doing. Now, as far as the internet's concerned, that's outside of the scope of this class, but the idea is, is for you to know the basics and how it works so you can understand how to upload your site. So we're going to start making web pages throughout this class. And the first thing we need to do is we need to come up with some sort of plan. What are we trying to build? What is the website? And typically when we do this, we try to come up with three things. We have a mission statement. We have to identify a target audience and then identify what the purpose of our site is. So if I'm trying to make a website to sell widgets, I need to have some sort of idea who are going to purchase those widgets. Who am I going to market to? What is my mission statement? What is the purpose of my site? And once I have these things, then I can start coming up with a design. Now, typically, it's best to come up with a design as a team because you have multiple people within, or within an organization that are going to be working together to try to come up with the design for the website and make it as usable as possible. So you want to try to work within a group if you can. That way everybody has some sort of input. The problem is, is if you're working by yourself at a company and you design the website, you're going to design the site the way you think it should be run, which may not necessarily be the way that everybody else is going to use it. So we, instead of having to design the site and make changes and make changes and make changes, if you work with the other people that are in the company, it'll make less work on your part. All right, so one of the things we need to be concerned with when we make a site is how fast it is. There is a lot of research out there in the Internet that you can find about how long you have to make a first impression. And on average, you have three seconds to make a, first, a good first impression on a website visitor. If the person cannot get to your site, locate the stuff that they're looking for, and figure out how to use their site in less than three seconds, they will go somewhere else. And the research also shows that once you lose that customer, you have very little, if no chance, to ever get them back. So make sure you want your website to load quickly, you want them to be able to figure out the site, and it needs to be what's called responsive. All right, so what does a web designer do? The web designer has to come up with some sort of plan, and then we have to come up with a design. And so once we have the plan and the design, our first thing is going to be this process called storyboarding and modeling. Now storyboarding is when you actually write your website out on a piece of paper. You, you actually draw it with pencil and paper and work with the client to try to figure out what they want. It is, it is a lot easier to draw it out on a piece of paper and have the client walk you through, I want this changed, I want this to look differently, let's move this over here, change these colors and so forth. It's easier on paper than it is to sit down on the computer and make changes and have to go back and forth. So what you want to do is you want to come up with a basic design that you and the client both agree on right at the beginning. And yes, you're going to have to change some stuff down the line, but as long as you have the general idea of what they want up front, it makes it a lot easier to figure out what exactly they need. One thing you need to keep in mind is you are working for them. They are paying you 
to make something for them. Therefore, you have to be able to take constructive criticism, and you also need to be willing to listen to whatever they're telling you to do. Don't argue with them. If they want something changed, make the change. It doesn't matter how you want it to look. It's up to the end or the person that's paying you as to exactly how it should be. You need to be aware of all of the current trends. If there's new technology out there that would make life easier for you and for the client, you need to be able to recommend that stuff. So make sure you keep up with current trends in web design. What kind of stuff do you need? All right, so to make a web page, all you need is a computer and internet connection. Once you have the internet connection, you just simply need a text editor. And on every operating system, you have text editors. Windows has Notepad. The Mac has TextEdit. Linux has Kate. Some of the best ones that are out there, though, are um, on Windows, we have a program called Notepad++. On Linux, you have a program called Kate and one called Vim. It doesn't matter what text editor you use, uh, but what you'll notice is some of them have extra tools available for us as a developer. I am going to use Windows, therefore I will be using Notepad++. However, any, any notepad, I'm sorry, any text editor would do just fine. All right, so once I create web pages, I need to upload them somewhere. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have to purchase a hosting account, which is a server somewhere on the internet where I can store my files so other people can find them. And the most common way to get my files from my computer out to the web is through something called File Transfer, Transfer Protocol, also known as FTP. Now, every operating system already has FTP capability built into it. You just may have to turn it on. Um, in this class, I'm going to use FileZilla. FileZilla is a program that's available for Windows, Mac, and Linux. Now, you could, if you want to, if you don't want to just simply use a text editor, you could use web development tools. There are paid programs like Microsoft Expressions Web. Um, there's Adobe Dreamweaver. But even Firefox and Google Chrome now have developer tools built right into them. So what do you need to learn? The basics of what you need to learn are just simply HTML, CSS, some minor graphic editing, and some soft skills. Now soft skills are the ability to talk to the client. You need to make sure that you're able to talk to them, that they can understand you, and that you can get along so you can come up with a design that they like. So what should you buy? Beyond a computer and internet access, you don't really need anything for making the web page. However, like I said, you need somewhere to put the files. So you need to purchase a domain name, that's your example.com, and then you also need to purchase a hosting account, which the hosting account, like I said, is a place to put your files on the web, and that allows other people to get to your website. There are a lot of companies out there, some of the more common ones are GoDaddy, one in one Network Solutions, Namecheap, and then there are a bunch of others. If you just go online and do a Google search for website hosting, you will see a lot of them. So in this lesson, you learned about the mission statement and target audience, how the web works, the differences between nodes, clients, and servers, how the MAC address and IP addresses are used to deliver packets, the difference between IP version 4 and IP version 6, the components of a URL, what a web designer does, and what tools you need to make websites, and why you need your website to be responsive. In the next lesson, you're going to learn the basics of actually editing and creating a web page. <laughs>